What we are looking at here is the posterior chest wall and the posterior mediastinum. So the mediastinum we'll come on to in the next session, so don't worry about that too much. But for now, it suffice to know that we are looking at the posterior thoracic wall and the space behind the heart. So this is a photogrammetry of the posterior thoracic wall that's come out of a cadaver. And unfortunately, there aren't any ways for me to hide the labels in this case, so please bear with. But to orient you, up here is the neck and this flap of muscle here is the diaphragm. Now we can see that the right hand side of the diaphragm raises higher, is more superior to the left hand side. And that's because the liver sits within the rib cage here. Now you'll notice I didn't say that the liver sits within the thorax and it's important distinction to make that the thorax is not interchangeable with rib cage. So the liver sits below the diaphragm but it sits within the rib cage. We can also see this flappy bit of tissue here or what's left of this flappy bit of tissue. This is the fibrous pericardium. And again, we'll come onto this more in more detail when we look at the mediastinum. But for now, it's important to know that the fibrous pericardium is essentially the bag in which the heart sits. We can also see two long pieces of string here, marked up number 28 and number 29. These are the phrenic nerves. Now, if we imagined our heart being back here and our lungs within the pleural cavities, we can see that these phrenic nerves on this dissection look a little bit saggy. Now, in reality, these phrenic nerves fall in front of the hilum of the lungs but they have been uh, stretched slightly in this specimen. So they look as though they're hanging further back, but that is not the case. The phrenic sits in front of the hilum of the lungs, and that's the same on both sides. Now we also have our secondary uh, feature of interest is the vagus nerve. Now we have two vagus nerves, one coming down each side. In this case, the right vagus nerve is actually very difficult to see, but we could just sort of see under here, at the top of the image where my mouse is, there is a, a slight stringy area, and this is the vagus nerve. But thankfully, we have the left one which is very easy to see, which is this traveling down here. This is number 21. So it's this nerve traveling down here. And eventually this will end in the abdomen. Now the vagus nerve has the parasympathetic control of the heartbeat and it sits behind where the hyla are. So the hilum will be here and here, and it's the same on both sides. But the left vagus nerve is slightly more interesting because as it's coming down past the aorta, which is here, we lose some fibres to it. And those fibres form the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now the left recurrent laryngeal nerve is the nerve that controls the intrinsic muscles of the larynx. So these are responsible, the intrinsic muscles of the larynx are responsible for creating sound. So what happens with this nerve is that it's come all the way from the brainstem. The vagus nerve is, vag is the cranial nerve 10, which comes all the way from the brainstem and loses some fibres underneath this arch of the aorta. And then it travels right back up to the larynx, to the voice box, as we know it as. 
Now this seems like a really strange piece of anatomy. Why would it do that when it's got to come past it on the way down anyway? Well, we don't really know. <laughs> However, it would seem that this uh, adaption to life happened millions and millions of years ago in that when we look at other animals, other mammals in particular, we can see that the left recurrent laryngeal nerve does exactly the same. So even in the giraffe, we have the vagus nerve, which travels from the brain down to the aorta and then up the full length back to the larynx. So what's really interesting about this? In a clinical scenario, if we was to see a patient with a chronic um, hoarseness to their voice, we would be concerned that we have got some kind of pathology happening in this area which is compressing this left recurrent laryngeal nerve. And that is what's creating this intermittent paralysis of the larynx, which is up here, and creating a chronic hoarseness. So this is how tumours around the heart, tumours within the mediastinum, can present, because of our anatomy, as a hoarse voice. So that was a little bit of interest in anatomy and very clinically relevant. But we also have things down here that we'd like to look at. So this is one of the posterior intercostal veins. Now, if I zoom out, we can reorientate ourselves. So this here is the diaphragm and we have the neck up here somewhere. But this is a nice neurovascular bundle, which shows how wonderful um, the anatomy is in that we have the posterior intercostal vein, the posterior intercostal artery and the posterior intercostal nerve. So that's V-A-N, van, from superior to inferior. And although the others haven't been dissected out as well that we can see, it will be the same in every one. The vein is always the superior. The nerve is always the most inferior within each intercostal space. We can see that neurovascular bundle is continuing to travel um, between, so this set of muscles here is the innermost intercostal muscles and the set behind which we cannot see the more superficial of the two the internal and it's forming a channel between the two within the costal groove of the ribs although for the purposes of dissection it looks as though it has been pulled out slightly so we can see it more clearly okay so Let's bring our model back to the front. Okay, so we are going to look at the posterior mediastinum now, or the mediastinum as a whole. And we can see that we have this giant vessel here. Now this is the aorta. And this part is the ascending aorta, which is coming directly from the left ventricle and transporting oxygenated blood around the systemic circulatory system. And if I turn this more laterally, we could see that this is the arch of the aorta, which we briefly touched on when we were discussing the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. And then we could see the descending thoracic aorta, traveling down the body slightly off the midline to the left hand side of the vertebral bodies. We can also see, if I zoom back in here, that this is the left primary bronchus, so the left main bronchus, and we have a mirror image one on this side, which is the right. Now remember the right is slightly wider and slightly more vertical.
So we can see that the carina will be approximately here. That's where the trachea bifurcates into the left and the right main bronchuses, bronchi. Now if I zoom out once more, we can see that we have this tube here. Now this tube is travelling behind the trachea, which is coming down here. It's travelling behind and it goes from mouth to stomach, so this must be the esophagus. There are two more uh, areas of interest in this video. One of them is this deep purple vessel here, which is the azygous vein. So as we can just about see, we have the tributaries. So these are the posterior intercostal uh, veins that are draining into the azygous, where they'll be taken back to the heart via the inferior vena cava. And we also have this duct here. So this is the thoracic duct. The thoracic duct begins its journey within the abdomen as the cisterna chili. So that sums up the main features that we see within the posterior thoracic wall and the posterior mediastinum.